Hello, everyone. I'm Kim Bischoff, the Executive Director for the NF Network, and we would like to welcome you to our webinar series. Tonight, we will be discussing NF1 and aging. We have 142 people registered from 32 different states and three international participants. These webinars have proven to be an excellent way for the network to reach individuals across the country. Tonight, we're very fortunate to have Dr. John Mulvihill from the NF Clinic at the University of Oklahoma College of Medicine, Pediatrics, Children's Hospital Foundation. Dr. Mulvihill has a vast expertise in clinical management of NF as well as research. In a couple of days, you can view this webinar and previous ones at our website, nfnetwork.org. I have just a couple of instructions to give you um, before we get started. After Dr. Mulvihill's talk, we'll have some time for questions and answers. Questions can be asked in two different ways. To write a question, which I'd read out loud, click on the question box, which is located on the lower portion of your webinar control panel. If you'd like to verbally ask a question, you will have needed to dial into the conference call number provided. Then click on the green hand icon next to your name in the webinar control panel to indicate that you have a question. When your name is called, then your, your phone will be activated. To remove the webinar control panel from the view of your screen, click the orange rectangular button with the arrow at the top left portion of the control panel. This may be necessary to have a complete view of the PowerPoint presentation. And now I would like to introduce you, Dr. John Mulvihill. Thank you for joining us tonight, Dr. Mulvihill. Thank you very much for all the arrangements. Well, glad to have you tonight. The, uh, and hello to all, all the participants. Um, I'm glad you're interested in the topic of NF1 and aging. In a sense, we're all getting older, so we all have to think about aging in any regard. Um, uh, you have. As soon as it starts, I can complete this slide. Um, I have um, my sponsorship, which is we're, grat we're grateful for the NF Network uh, for facilitating this. I go way back to Marianne Wilson and the Neurofibromatosis Inc. So uh, I, she might, I doubt that she's getting any older, but uh, some of us <laughs> are. Um, and I'm also uh, have a logo for the Department of Pediatrics and the Children's Hospital Foundation, which is a sponsor of my professor professorial chair. So I like to give them credit. Um, let's see. I'm not in control quite yet, Kim. Yes, you are. You should be able to forward your slides just like you do any other um, presentation. Uh, but. See, should I get out of it? But I'm not sure how to get out of it. <laughs> um, Can you? Oh, there you go. Well, let's see. I mean, this is the correct one, so I guess I'll just yeah. Well, there. There you go. Okay, so there's my name, and I want to credit the grant. We had a Department of Defense grant that some of you helped probably either review or to uh, persuade Congress to fund, uh, and I'm in the Department of Pediatrics at Oklahoma. The um, uh, reason I got into this, that I knew this was an area uh, not uh, subject to much research, so it's always good to find an area that where you can make a difference, on average in PubMed, there's been one article a year on the issue of aging and neurofibromatosis, so it's been grossly understudied. But Recklinghausen's original patient, Marie, died uh, at the age, of, I think, of 55 or 62 uh, of lung bleeding, probably from metastatic uh, tumor of the duodenum. I had a patient in Oklahoma. Uh, actually, she wasn't a patient. She was actually well, uh, and she used to teach, come in once a, day, once a year to teach the first-year medical students about NF1. I called her my professor of NF1. Uh, she was 88, and now actually a couple of years ago she died, not of neurofibromatosis, but she had it when she died. So she was a wonderful volunteer and would explain to the students that the burden of NF for her was the embarrassment of people asking about her bumps. Uh, also in Oklahoma, there was a state legislator who got into politics because he had neurofibromatosis, as did his sister, who runs one of the support groups in Oklahoma. 
So they're an inspiration. And finally, my wife, when we moved to Oklahoma 13 years ago, she was over the age of 50 and hence was eligible for geriatrics. And of course, she did it and got much better care than I got for picking an internist. And that was my lesson for what a role the geriatrician can make. Because geriatrics, or clinical gerontology, the science of aging, is an age-specific medicine like pediatrics. Um, in a sense, there's lots of similarities. We handle all diseases as a pediatrician, which I am, but um, we are sensitive to the age-specific issues. And so it was important to study the age-specific issues in NF, I thought. Um, obviously, one of our um, former first ladies says it takes a village to raise a family or a person, but it also takes a village to age a person. You need a team of, uh, to care for uh, an older person um, because it's very complex. So geriatrics really brings a very wonderful holistic view of the patient, examining where they are in life, where they are in other diseases, um, to take total care of them. Because I realize, as the uh, old medical director of the state institution I knew in Pennsylvania said, we are all TAPS, temporarily abled persons. And at a certain time frame, either early in life or later in life, we lose some of our abilities. I've lost some vision. I've lost some hearing. I've lost my appendix and my tonsils. Um, we're all losing it at an uncertain time frame. And the issue is, what's normal? Uh, and is there anything specific to neurofibromatosis? In a sense, like a car or a washing machine, the warranty is sort of expiring on some of us. Things go wrong, sometimes all at once, or spotty failures, spotty weaknesses in this or that organ. And the question that NF families have, is it due to NF, and what do we have to do about it, or not? That is one of the questions that could be answered. Obviously, uh, people get other diseases as they get older, not related to NF1. We have to sort them out. Those diseases sometimes lead people to multiple medications. Um, uh, and also, just socially, you, you know, often an, an older person isn't gainfully employed other than at home or cooking for their spouse or doing laundry um, at home. Um, and so that can lead to isolation that may increase the burden of isolation that having a infrequent disease brings anyway. Therefore, there could be low esteem and depression, uh, all of which could be addressed by the healthcare system. The problem is, in America, we don't have one. We, we, it's, not direct, it's not a system. It's a non-system. It's not directed to healthy living. It's directed to acute sicknesses. And it's not always caring. It's sort of a quick fix. Um, and so we got to figure out how to make a system work for a patient, uh, an older patient with NF, for example. Um, and the one thing, don't all of you nod at once, because if you've ever said, my doctor doesn't know, does know little or nothing about NF, the world will tip if even all of you nod your head in agreement. Um, but it's true. So we um, wrote a grant uh, to the DOD, and it got funded, um, uh, on called International Interdisciplinary Analysis of the Issues. <clears throat> we had three big goals. One was just to study death certificates or death data and disease rate data um, in the US, in Canada, and Denmark to see what, um, at what age people with NF were dying and of what, if we could tell. Uh, we also used in each country a special database. In Vancouver, most of you are familiar with Dr. Friedman and Patricia Birch who run uh, what used to be the International Neurofibromatosis Database, initiated by the old NF Foundation, the Childhood Tumor Foundation. Uh, so we partnered with them to analyze older age in that database. Um, the U.S. Veterans Administration system is huge. It's the hugest healthcare system in the U.S., uh, and they have an excellent data system that keeps track of all their hospital discharges, and I had experience with that when I worked at NIH. So we identified a collaborator who could analyze those data. Uh, and then, as you'll hear later, we collaborated with Denmark because we had previously been involved with a very precious patient series that an old psychiatrist, um, Alan Borberg, uh, 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 wrote up uh, in, in the 1940s. He actually published after the war in 1951, but he did the work in the early 40s. 
So each country had a special database that we could get some insights about the issue of aging in NF1. And then uh, actually an early thing, um, although these were all going on simultaneously, we wanted to have focus groups of patients, of older patients, their siblings, their caregivers, um, in um, uh, Oklahoma City, Vancouver, and Copenhagen. And for those that wanted to, we were willing to do gene testing because our lab had experience in that, and that might eventually be useful in understanding the data. Well, at the top right corner of the, these series of slides are the collaborator in this network that really did the work that I'm reporting to you. So this is really a presentation from all of us. Dr. Friedman had already, during a sabbatical at the Atlanta Centers for Disease Control, CDC, uh, analyzed with Dr. Rasmussen, a former student of mine at NIH and now at CDC, the causes of death in neurofibromatosis in the whole U.S. Uh, from a very special data file called the multiple causes of death. Usually death statistics are based on one diagnosis, but there's the special files that list up to, I think I've heard 21 different diagnoses that doctors write on death certificates, and they're all coded. Um, and, and filed um, electronically um, at the National Center for Health Statistics. So Jan and his collaborators at CDC analyzed 32 million death certificates during those age range that I show on the screen uh, and felt after assessing the codes and trying to eliminate neurofibromatosis type 2, about 3,800 uh, individuals that probably had NF1. Uh, and they did a lot of analyses, and the one I want to show from their paper in 19, 2001, so these are old data, um, that on, on the left panel are, are men and the right panel are females. On the right of each block is what the average age at death or the median age at death in the U.S. was for males, 71 years. Uh, and the box shows that about half of them were between the ages of, what, 60 and 80. And for females, they lived about eight years longer in that era. For NF1 individuals, uh, each of uh, males or females, they're all about, well, what is it, uh, 15 to 16 years earlier median average cause of death with still a very wide range of what it could be. But yes, we'd have to say that statistically, the average age of death is lower for individuals with NF1 uh, versus without NF1. Now, it doesn't mean they died from it. They may have died with it of other reasons. And that's what we hope to uh, dissect out, um, probably not with the US data, but with other data. Here's the data from um, the US displayed differently. The blue line is the um, age at which people die in the general population. So um, there, we see there's a big spike in the blue line around 80. So that's where a lot of people die at age 80. And they can uh, other people die as late as 100. And some people at the left side of that blue line die very early in infancy, infant mortality. Um, that's um, obviously a, a present. And what's different for the 3,800, 3,770 individuals with NF1, as best as they could tell from the death certificates, is that the whole curve at the old age is shifted about 15 years to the left. And that's the earlier age of death that we talked about already. And curiously, uh, there's a bump of, uh, of too many people dying, well, even between the age of 10 and 40, a big gap over what the general population does. So um, um, the, the team at CDC in the 2001 analyzed that, and, and we did further analysis on it um, uh, as part of this project with Dr. Friedman. Um, for example, just looking at the issue of cancers or tumors, there's a measure called PMR, proportionate mortality ratio, saying what's the rate of death in the general population, um, which, is, which divides the rate in the NF population. So if they were exactly equal, the PMR would be 1. 
num same number on top and on the bottom. But here it's 20% bigger, 1.2 instead of 1.0, which means about a 20% excess of deaths due to any cancer in the NF1 group. And the numbers at the right say that because 1.1 is not in that range, they would call it statistically significant. But it's a very small increase of uh, death from or with cancer and neurofibromatosis. What's big, and we all know it, is that there's a high proportion of PMR, uh, 35 or 34, due to soft tissue tumors, the sarcomas, the malignant peripheral nerve sheath tumors uh, of NF1. And that's known, and this is um, a helpful number uh, that says it's about 30 times the usual rate, 35 times the usual rate. Now keep in mind that the usual rate for this very rare cancer is very low. So the real risk of any one person get, getting attacked by this cancer is actually still pretty low, but it's much larger than the general population. And brain tumors as well is uh, about five times the usual rate in the general population. Um, to show the data a different way, he plotted out um, what the PMR was by different ages. And for the next three graphs, they'll all be somewhat the same, showing that the excess, the big excess for, for soft tissue tumors is in early age, from age 10 to 40, that middle bump. And at the older ages, yes, the rate is higher, but not anything like the uh, 30, uh, well, the 70-fold uh, excess in 20-year-olds. So the other tumor that was looked at was brain tumors, and that's somewhat the same, saying at older ages, brain tumors aren't too big a problem in neurofibromatosis 1. The big problem is ages 10 to 40, where it's up to 12 times as common for the teenagers than the general population. Finally, there's this weird word, vasculopathy. That's sort of a made-up word to say, what about cardiac disease? Both blood vessel disease and heart disease are put in this together. And remember I said that one is just expect, is expected from the general population. So in older ages, from 30 to 70, it's round one. So that says to us that people with neurofibromatosis don't have any excess risk of death due to heart attacks, which are so common, um, or blood vessel disease in general, that that disease, although rare in under age 10, is where the excess is. Um, I know I'm raising a lot of questions, so I suggest you just make a little note on a scratch of paper, perhaps, because I can't see you, uh, and we'll be glad to answer questions uh, at the end. The um, next way of looking at these data was to switch over to the uh, United Kingdom, to England, where Dr. Garth Evans was a consultant to our project. It began with Dr. Susan Eusen, but she couldn't come from Manchester for our summary meeting on this project in Oklahoma City uh, last fall. So Garth came, and we we're glad, I think, the world of him, and he has published information that we all need to know about in regard to NF and other conditions that predispose to cancer. He had, uh, uh, whereas we had data from the U.S. for death certificates, we know that's not a perfect reflection of what's really happening because of the, uh, the quality of death certificates is uneven anywhere around the world. Whereas in Gareth's uh, neighborhood, Manchester, England, there's very good cancer registries where every case is collected. Here on a population of about 4 million from 1960 to the present, they collect all malignant tumors, cancer, like sarcomas, uh, and all brain tumors, whether they're called malignant or not, because brain tumors tend to be malignant just because they're growing in a small box. And they verify them not just with death certificates, but also with path records, which are better quality of information. That's for all ages. For childhood, they're, they're even an older registry. They go back to 1956 and collect all tumors, benign and malignant, for kids verifying both with path records and with updates from the hospital records to see how the kids have done later in life. So that's good. And Gareth uh, 
did some calculations about what's the frequency here of NF1 to antrinomycosis that, that are used around the world for textbooks and such, and uh, jive with what we know about uh, the frequency uh, of it. But in the number of living patients, he has a large number, 900 patients, that he's been analyzing. And his anal uh, part, one of the slides he showed is this, that shows at the very left well, what's the average life expectancy or the, technically the median life expectancy for blue males and pink females. Um, so for males, it's 78 years of age and versus 82 for females. Um, a little different from what we are in the U.S., but the, again, females do better than men. Um, so that's for uh, people in the general population. Skipping over to the NF1 and NF2 lines, we see that life expectancy, as we saw in the U.S. data, are decreased a little bit. What's that? Uh, from about 71 from, so that's about eight years difference for men and about the same for women. And although men and women reverse, it's about the same, um, a little bit worse for NF2. The other conditions are um, cancer related, but not not directly related to NF2, so I won't dwell on them. Well, where can, else can we get an insight about this? Denmark, wonderful Denmark. And um, we would always be speaking Danish if the course of uh, British history was any different than it was, but uh, the Brits won and the English didn't, so we're speaking English. But Denmark has a wonderful system uh, and a socially supported system of medicine and medical research using uh, databases. So all this work I'll talk about in Denmark, uh, almost all of it was done by record linkage, which is very cheap, very thorough, and it covers the whole nation. So whereas we tried to cover the whole nation of the US in, with death certificates, we know they're imperfect. Uh, we tried to cover an area of the UK with registry data there. But here we can cover, uh, Janet Winther and her colleagues can cover all of Denmark. And so at the top, there are three separate groups of individuals that we can identify with NF. One is what I mentioned, Dr. Broberg's um, MD thesis, where he went to every hospital in Denmark and said, give me all your patients who have neurofibromatosis. I want to do a study. He studied them and their records. And he went to the homes of those the people who had been in hospital, knocked on the door and said, you don't know me, but I'm Dr. Alan Bodelberg. I'm very interested in the disease that might be in your family. And he examined patients in their home and found a lot of other patients that met the diagnosis of NF1 but were never in a hospital. And a lot of the research we've done on neurofibromatosis begins in the hospital record room, where, of course, they're going to be sicker than if they never wound up in a hospital. So just within the Broberg uh, group, we were able to separate out the worst end of the spectrum, those that got in the hospital, from the less severe end of the spectrum. And uh, Dr. Winter was able to also go to the population-based registry. Everyone who's ever been in a hospital gets on a, a registry. And so you know, legally empowered and uh, funded researchers can ethically go to the record for medical research purposes. Uh, now, it doesn't go back as far as the Berber cohort, uh, but it's the whole country. Then finally, there are the death certificates on the right box of NF in the country. So she's still conducting the analysis of death, mortality, cancer, and morbidity, that is, other diseases. And so she has now a total of 2,800 uh, patients with NF. Um, a little less than what we saw in the whole United States for those years, but still a very large number. They're from different groups, and only 12 in the center of these overlying groups are both in the Broberg cohort, um, in the death certificate registry on the right, and in the hospital registry on the left. But each of these uh, groups of patients will be examined, uh, not the patients themselves, but their data will be examined to see if they can clarify uh, the issues that we've seen in the other data. For example, and this is what Dr. Asker Sorensen and I published in New England Journal in 86, 
where he was able to go to the records collections and ask the question, how many patients from the time that Broberg left the study and published it and went into private practice of psychiatry not to see the patients again, from that time, around 1944, his last visits to the patients, to the present at that time, 40 years later, how many people are still living? That's the percent survival label on the left, going from none surviving, everyone's dead, and that's not in any of these diagrams, to 100%, all of those that were living at the beginning, over time. Now, there's two groups of patients here. It's a very confusing diagram, I know. On the left are what we call the probands, those cases that were found because they were in a hospital. So they're going to be more severe. But then on the right are the incidentally diagnosed relatives that Dr. Broberg met in going to the homes. Uh, and they're going to be milder. Now each diagram has two lines in it. The one with little boxes is what he observed in the top left box on the 36 males that were probands. At the bottom, the 40 females that were probands. The top curve with a little whisker, we call it, a measurement of error around the circles, is what would have been expected over the whole country of Denmark in that era, in that age group, and in that gender, male or female. So it's a smoother curve because it's got built on so many patients. And both of the curves answer the question, how many people after 10, 20, 30, 40 years, are, what percentage of the initial cases are still living? So what you see is that each of the observed curves, the boxes, are below the expected. In other words, they are dying earlier than the normal Dane. Um, if you look at the 50%, we'd say, like in, for the males, going across 50% of the Broberg men were dead maybe around age 30 years after follow-up, whereas um, it takes 40 or 45 years, it's not on that curve of the probands, for half of the patients to be dead. The other thing is you see that um, for the probands, the females did worse than the males, but for the relatives, if you didn't wind up in a hospital as a female, you did pretty good. You did almost what the other women, of uh, Danish women, did in that era. So there is a big difference between uh, how serious NF can be. And the real truth is probably halfway in between these two diagrams. We'll be updating those diagrams with Dr. Winther uh, as, the, uh, as the study progresses. Well, finally, and now we've changed the name of the investigator Dr. to Dr. Teasdale, my partner at the University of Oklahoma. He's a whiz at focus groups. He didn't know neurofibromatosis at all, but we needed him to organize uh, focus groups hopefully in all three countries. And as it played out, we never did get them going in Denmark, partly because we're speaking English, not Danish, although they speak a lot of English too, but we didn't want the patients to have to speak in English in Copenhagen. And the focus groups uh, fo um, it, uh, enrolled patients, their brothers and sisters who didn't have NF, and their caregivers, maybe a spouse, maybe a child, or maybe a parent still, on what are the issues in growing old with neurofibromatosis, so that we could just get a feel for the issues. That means it's qualitative research and not quantitative. We're not measuring or counting anything. We're just, what's your impression? And that's a very important place to start for all uh, patient-oriented research. And we did, um, we did list, checklist of what's the issue clinically or medically, what's the issue in living that you have, so that we could get a list of other ideas to do more systematic research on. Uh, and that was all brought together at this workshop we had last fall, um, which is why I'm speaking to you today. We never did get to the last bullet of the project, and not all projects come to a complete end. Uh, every research project seems to go on. Um, we never did try to get the list of issues into a, a, a more formal study. That will be for the next grant. So the focus group that wound up having 30 people uh, was a surprisingly low number, but we think it's all very valid, it was held in Oklahoma City and Vancouver. We recruited from clinic, um, from the support group in the two places, flyers and, and word of mouth. We made a list of 
questions to ask. What, are, what prevents you? What's the barriers? What helps you? What's the facilitators for your getting care? How are you doing socially? How bad a disease do you have? Uh, it's all a matter of perception. Some people with exactly the same medical diagnosis, some might be suffering and others might be saying, so what? And <laughs> life goes on. Um, uh, how are you doing in family support? What do you want your care to be? What do you prefer? Um, in Oklahoma, because of small numbers, we added a few one-on-one -on -one interviews because there wasn't going to be a focus group at the time. This, these patients from rural Oklahoma were into the city. Um, and all, all this type of focus work issue stops when you're getting the same answers from the next focus groups. And that was a surprising number of only 30 people felt gave us a very valid impression. Oh my word, I'm not advancing again. Uh, oh no, okay, well, there's something. Uh, this is the right slide. So for example, <laughs> um, uh, one probe was, how, please tell me, NF affects you. And one respondent, uh, and these might be the remarks of several respondents, says, it's taken a lot away from my social life. I can't go bowling. I can't work in the garden anymore. I can't do my normal activities. I'm only 51. I should be enjoying all this stuff, but it's taking a lot of things away from me because of the pain. So in, the, in analyzing the data, getting to the kernel of the issue, the team decided, well, this addresses quality of life, it addresses physical limitation, and it addresses how is pain getting managed. And all those can be addressed if you know what the issue is. Or another probe was, what happens when you see a doctor? You can just hear this. I can just hear this Oklahoma accent. He don't know nothing about this disease. I discuss it with him. He doesn't know. Um, I don't think he's ever seen it before. Um, I, uh, so in discussing with someone that doesn't understand the issue, the stress, the stuff, they don't understand. And that's clearly an issue of uh, physician knowledge or maybe attitude. So Tom, uh, Dr. Teasdale, <laughs> my buddy Tom, um, summarized the, these self-reported health-related issues, that the s things that stress adults about NAP1 are different from what we know about childhood. Will my child have a tumor? Will my child lose sight? Will he lose his leg? So it's different in adults, as we could have guessed, but exactly what are they? And part of it is that the burden or the stigma, the the sign over your head, here's an NF patient, is less an issue, and the need for information is bigger. Um, all of the people, uh, whether they're affected or not, said their doctors, their healthcare providers don't know NF. They're undertrained in diagnosing it, taking care of it, and even referring us. They don't know who to refer us to. Uh, the docs don't address the issues that are important to us older patients. Um, the docs, sure, they address the real the reason I say I came in. That's understandable. That's what they're supposed to do. But they and they only address the medical conditions that they're familiar with, not the ones that are important to me. That's not appropriate. Um, so there's no, lack of attention to the NF specific issues that are physical or mental that interfere with quality of life and the livelihood of the patient. And therefore, most of the respondents in these focus groups um, just don't bother. They don't go to their doctor because their providers, quote, know less about NF than they do than ourselves. And you've, that's probably all familiar to you. So in crystallizing and boiling it all down to the issues uh, that the focus groups told us that are being missed by their doctors and health, other health care providers, PAs or advanced practice nurses, is uh, in five big areas. Relieving my symptom, in confusion about the condition, activities of daily life, mental health, and future concerns. And you can see the bullets in, uh, under it. Cosmetics is still a big issue. How do I look? Why am I tired? Is this symptom due or not due to NF1? Um, how come you don't know too much about it. How come you're not even sympathetic or empathetic with my concerns? Um, how is my getting older changing what I can do? Um, and how is my family helping me? 
and mental health issues about uh, how bubbly am I, how buoyant am I, what's my strengths, or putting in a negative thing, am I depressed, am I weak, um, how am I coping, um, how am I dealing with you know, this in my family that I passed it on to my poor grandson, um, uh, why me, am I going to die, why this burden. And in America, what's this going to cost me, and um, then for everyone, um, how is this going to affect my life? So Tom and his uh, team really focused on educating doctors um, much more than the, uh, I know how to do. Uh, decided that the two things that they could do is to develop educational materials, uh, both for the provider and focused on the adult patient as opposed to the pediatric patient. Uh, and then they devised a study that did not get funded, and he's going to try again, oh, we're not going to let go of this, where he would have a three-year program where first he'd recruit a, a primary care doctors, internists, geriatricians, uh, maybe neurologists, uh, although they're too specialized, um, to participate, provide them education, test their knowledge ahead of time, uh, test how they're uh, re referring and managing NF1, then introduce an educational reinforced, they call it a reinforced educational program, where they here the plan was to email the doctor once a month. Uh, this is a little pearl about NF1 and aging that you might not know. It might serve you uh, in good stead. And even as drug salesmen do, they, what's it called, the detail man or woman, they would propose on the, on the money of the grant to visit the doctor's office every three months and say, I'm your NF uh, information source. Have you had an NF patient in the last three months? Here's a new article about NF1. Um, uh, there's a new study, et cetera. Um, and then at, after one year of that um, reinforced education, to go back and see what they knew. Has their attitude changed? And how are they doing with their patients? Are their patients getting referred? Are they getting the care they need? Uh, and all this was a grand plan that was going to be very expensive, but we thought would answer the question and introduce our findings uh, experiment, introduction of our findings into the geriatric or primary care system. Well, he didn't get the grant and he'll try again. So um, the key points was that he felt that multiple methods had to be used. We need to measure knowledge, attitudes, and perceptions. We need a full multi-systems multi information system to uh, increase their educational resources, uh, to get them to serve these patients with NF1, and as a geneticist, I'm interested in other genetic disease too, and the, some of the same issues, some of the issues are the same about improving quality of care for rare diseases. That, uh, in the bottom right, is the logo for the Heartland Collaborative Consortium uh, paid for by the HRSA, uh, another agency of the U.S. government that brings you Medicare and Medicaid. So that's my summary statement. So thank you for listening. My acknowledgments are to the collaborators in Vancouver, in Copenhagen, in Oklahoma City. Uh, these are my research assistants in my own shop. Of course, Vic Riccardi is one of my heroes. We did the first workshop in monograph and NF1. Um, my boss, Bob Miller at the National Cancer Institute, got me going on NF1 as well as the patients. And of course, the funding from my agencies and um, the, National, the Children's Tumor Foundation helped a little bit with the project, and now we're, grat we're grateful to NF Network to, for its work. So I think I'll be glad to answer questions if any came in, Kim. Yep, we did get some. Thank you very much. Very informative um, presentation. Uh, I'm going to start with uh, Karen's question she typed in. She says, my biggest concern is at 42, I've already had multiple surgeries of my plexiform, that um, they can never get it all. It's eroded the skull. Afraid this growth will, of course, keep continuing to grow, and that will be my downfall. Also, never know if my ailments are regular ailments, not NF-related, or if they are NF-related, and, of course, the doctor never seems to know. That sounds familiar, Karen. I'm sorry about the trouble you've had with plexiforms. That's one of the biggest uh, just 
hardest nut to crack. Uh, I mean, you have the tumor yourself, and you know how hard it is. And the research on it, there's a lot of research going on, and it hasn't got to the magic bullet yet. Um, I hope, I'm not sure where you're at, but if you're at a place at all or have an NF doctor or even want to email me, I think, I think my email is on the corner, yeah, it's on the corner of the screen. Um, and maybe we can try to find, if you're near a clinical trial site where there is now the neurofibromatosis clinical trial network that Dr. Kaur, who's been part of this project as well, he came to the workshop for his wisdom. Um, there are clinical trials for plexiform neurofibromas that are trying different agents, gentle chemotherapy agents, I count them as, uh, for people that have just these stubborn plexiform neurofibromas. So you might want to consider one of those, and we can help you identify those, or just going to clinicaltrials.gov might help you find them. It doesn't mean that they won't slow down. We do know that um, there's ages, especially in middle age, when they do seem to grow, or even earlier age. Uh, but we're not hearing it as a big problem with continual growth in an older age. So, you know, God willing, you'll just get older and maybe it'll quiet down. We, I'm sorry I don't have a better answer, in this, but you're the subject of research, I can assure you. Thank you. This one's from Teresa. She said, I've read where hormonal changes, menopause, can exasperate NF causing tumor growth. Should I ask my doctor for some type of hormonal ther therapy as I enter menopause in order to slow or starve off tumor growth? Would it really help? I don't have a lot of confidence in my doctor in dealing with, N with NF in Springdale, Arkansas. Mm -hmm. um, the, uh, the hormonal control of, of like skin neurofibromas, if that's what you're talking about, has been studied, and it and and we've all shared. We in neurofibromatosis clinics have shared our stories that yes, we see an increase of manifestations in puberty um, and in pregnancy. Uh, so we know there must be something about estrogen, um, but it increases for men as well. So maybe it's all the pubertal hormones, the sex hormones that seems to stir up, especially in teenage years, um, the skin changes and the, and the skin neurofibromas. Uh, in menopause, in, in pregnancy though, uh, well, in, uh, the curiosity is that when women go on the birth control pill, that doesn't seem to stimulate um, the uh, skin and uh, manifestations. So it's not strictly estrogen or progesterone, and we don't know. We, I don't hear the story that menopause makes things worse. Um, we do know that sometimes the bumps get worse with age. Um, so I, I can't advise you directly, but it's well worth the discussion with two people, a gynecologist or an internist managing uh, hormone replacement. And perhaps you could go to Little Rock for um, a consultation on neurofibromatosis. They have these two docs there that know NF uh, very well and maybe could talk to you about um, trying it. Um, so I don't see any reason not to try hormonal um, supplementation, even for other reasons perhaps associated with menopause, knowing that it should be temporary. It's to get you over this hump of when your hormones are changing, and it doesn't mean you should stay on it lifelong. But if there's issues that could be relieved of, of menopause, could be relieved by hormonal replacement, I think it's well worth the discussion, if not of, uh, trying it out. And Teresa is my mother's name, so you have my full sympathy. And, and this one is from Sally. Sally has a lot of questions, and they're really about neurofibromas as, as individuals get older, the growth of them. And she'd really like to hear you talk about electrodistification. Um, it's one I know that you're probably familiar with with Dr. Weinberg out of New York. Mm -hmm. she, actually, she has enough questions here probably to put a whole webinar together um, on this very important topic to individuals with NF. I mean, she's wondering why more clinics don't do this. Um, and in um, really ways to treat the neurofibromas. Yeah, yeah. 
especially the facial ones that are, you know, are seem to be such a burden uh, because of their appearance and stares that it gets. Um, I've had um, patients from Oklahoma go to uh, New York for that, and they seem to be very satisfied. We just don't have a local expert in Oklahoma City, which doesn't have all specialties for lots of things, but uh, we haven't identified a surgeon who is into the electrodissection uh, for, um, for cutaneous neurofibromas. Uh, obviously, the general principle is we try not to take off a lot of neurofibromas because it seems that other ones just grow. It's almost as though that skin has declared it's going to make a neurofibroma whether you take the one before it uh, or the one after it off. I'm still going to be a neurofibroma. It's, it's stubborn, and that, that skin cell is really stubborn in my mind. Um, so I don't have any personal experience with it. And again, the generalization is we try to avoid uh, a lot of surgery um, unless they're really in a critical nuisance place, uh, you know, the tip of the nose or where a bra strap is or a belt is, uh, and it rubs the wrong way all the time. Uh, so I would be curious if you could mount a webinar on it. I would probably attend it myself. Yeah, I think that's a very good idea, Sally. Thanks for giving us that suggestion there. Um, then let me go over to this one here. Um, this one that was the first question actually that was typed in um, today, and it's talking about the itching with neurofibromatosis, the uncontrollable itching. Mm -hmm. Yes, I've heard those stories. Um, and and we don't have too many patients with that, and we don't have any magic bullet. I know Dr. Riccardi tried an experimental medicine about eight years ago and felt it didn't work. Um, and I, I, if you could find a sympathetic dermatologist to discuss it with, you know, could Benadryl help? Could any powders help? Could any skin um, uh, treatment like bathing or powders or salves help at all. Um, it's, it's stubborn, not for a lot of patients, and I'm sorry that it's, um, it's a problem for you, uh, but I would say there's no magic bullet for that, sorry to say. Okay. Um, this one comes from Sarah, and Sarah's from Detroit. Uh, let's see, it just got shifted on me here. Let's go back here. Says, I'm in Detroit. My son is 18 and has NF1. I noticed the spike in the 20 to 30 year old, 30 year olds of soft tissue cancer. What seems to be the cause of this? Oh well, I mean, like the cause of any cancer, we, for an individual, we often don't know uh, the exact details, um, and we tend to think just generally about how cancer starts with a, a mutation. Uh, very early in life, maybe even before delivery, that sits there and just other ch gene changes might occur that all of a sudden, as they accumulate um, during life, crop into a cancer that makes itself its presence known and may even s and spread. So I, the, there's been concerns that surgery could trip off the development of a malignancy in neurofibromatosis. I don't really believe that. Uh, there's been concerns about radiation treatment for an early cancer that could trip off the beginning of a, a sarcoma, soft tissue tumor, um, uh, or injections. All of these have been hypotheses uh, or bone fracture. Uh, that I don't think have been verified by any real uh, rigid uh, study about causation. So uh, again, keep in mind, although that's a high relative risk, uh, it's against a very, very small number. So you know, 30 times a very small number is still a small number. So there's probably other things to worry about with your regard to your 20 and 30 year olds than that. He has to be aware of his health, uh, and hopefully he's you know, somewhat health conscious and would report any health change so that uh, he could see a doctor right away if he felt or you felt there was any concern. Thank you. 
This is coming from David. He actually has two questions. The first one is, I would like to see funding going to medical schools teaching new doctors about NF. I have NF1 and work at a medical school and see no talk about NF. He's wondering why. And then the <laughs> second part, he's heard about B. propolis. Help slow the growth of tumors. Then he wants to know what you've heard. Um, what, what, I missed the agent. Uh, B. propolis. Um, I, let's see, I'm not, that's not quite coming up on my screen. Um, I'm not part of the clinical trials, so I think I'd have to ask him to query like clinicaltrials.gov or even Google that agent to see if he could find it. So I guess I have no comment to be helpful on that agent. With regard to education, though, I have a very strong opinion, and maybe you can pull this off in your nearest medical school, is that for our Oklahoma medical students, the first patient they see has neurofibromatosis. Uh, they come in the middle of August, and the first or so week of September, um, I give a lecture on neurofibromatosis as part of the basic science course in genetics, which is where they start their basic science training in almost all medical schools. Uh, I give a lecture about it, and after that one-hour lecture, they go to their small groups of about uh, 10 students each, and they meet a person or a family with neurofibromatosis. They have their checklist of what the signs are. They don't examine the patient, but they just talk to the patient. I give them a little script that has them ask the question, why do you know you have neurofibromatosis? What has your doctor done for you? What would you want to tell a first-year medical student about neurofibromatosis? They interview for an hour. Then overnight, they prepare a, about a five-minute talk of summarizing the patient's story and the family tree. And they also have to go to, I've mentioned it now four times, clinicaltrials.gov to see what new agents are being tried on for what manifestations of NF1 so they know that database and they know research is important for all doctors to be supportive of. So I would say if you, you could find your geneticist at your medical school, find out who's in charge of the medical student course right at the beginning of school and tell them to talk to me or tell them about the experience in Oklahoma and why don't they do that in wherever you're at. Do you think you can do that? Yeah, that sounds really good. Thank you for doing that for um, our families, Dr. Mobile Hill. I appreciate it. And I think you may have answered Marcy's question as well. She's really looking for ways to get involved in clinical trials. Her question was because her parents are deceased, what clinical trials will be available for her to participate in. But um, I think that website that you've been giving, clinicaltrials.gov, um, is probably the best way for her to get that information. Do you have anything else you want to add on that? No, nope, you just type in neurofibromatosis um, and uh, you see what they show. There's both active trials, uh, namely they still want more patients, or there's some trials that don't need new patients because they're analyzing the data. But the last time I went in, several months ago, there were about uh, 35 trials going on. Not all of them uh, address all ages, not all of them address therapy, and you just scroll through that to see if um, if there's any that are addressing the manifestations that are bothering you. Okay. Um, well then, I think I'm getting some thank yous, like Sarah from California saying thank you for answering the questions, and I, we've addressed the majority of the questions that are on here. I'd like to thank you, Dr. Mobile, for your time this evening um, and putting this webinar together for us and for everybody who's participated. My pleasure. Our job is to sustain hope, and I, I hope this was helpful for you. And um, there is, um, I think, light at the end of the tunnel. Okay. Good night. Good note to close on. Thank you, Dr. Mobile. Good night, everybody.